I was on mute. My bad. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not used to doing these personal, you know, presentations. It's been a while. This is a picture of me from before COVID. Um, so, uh, a little bit of backstory about me. Uh, for 19 years, I worked for Red Hat. The joke is that I did every possible job you could do at Red Hat, short of cleaning the bathrooms, and I think I might have done that once or twice. Um, uh, in 2020, because it seemed like a good time to change jobs, uh, I switched and went over to work for a small cloud startup out of Seattle. Uh, you might have heard of us. Um, uh, I work for the open source strategy and marketing team. Uh, one of my main roles is to work with internal groups to help them understand how to do open source better. Uh, also working with partners to help them understand how to do open source better and to work with customers to help them understand how to do open source better. Uh, so it's a lot of me saying things to people and then them saying, yeah, that makes sense and then not doing it. Uh, but it's fun. I enjoy it. I like the opportunity to uh, tackle big problems and I think that working on open source is one of the most challenging problems you can have. Uh, this is also me. Uh, since 2003, I've been working on the Fedora project. Uh, I've been a Fedora council member for two terms now. Uh, I am a Fedora packager and sponsor, and recently ran the numbers and realized that I maintain about 1% of Fedora, which is truly terrifying. Um, but uh, it means that I've had a lot of time to write a lot of documentation, think about a lot of community processes, so I'm not just coming at this talk from a purely corporate perspective. In my heart, in my soul, I am a community contributor, regardless of who pays me. Uh, and I've been grateful enough to work at places where they have let me sort of openly contribute without restriction. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about what motivates companies. So it's important to remember why companies exist. Fundamentally, it's that. They want to make money. There are exceptions to this rule. Obviously, there are NGOs, nonprofit entities, and corporations. Sometimes we'll do things for community and goodwill. But overwhelmingly, their actions are viewed through the lens of, will this make us money? <laughs> Does this put any of the other efforts that we have that make us money at risk? Uh, so when you're thinking about companies and open source, it's always sort of valuable to think about, when, you, when they do something weird or they do something confusing, is to ask, does this put their money at risk in any real way? Because if it does, it may start to may help them better understand why they've done that strange thing. Now, the second thing that motivates companies is lawyers. Uh, with money comes lawyers to protect the company. They exist to minimize the risks that arise when the company does anything. Now, some companies are obviously more litigious than others. Um, and if you look at smaller companies, they tend to be at a different sort of legal risk. Uh, their risk is because if they make a significant mistake, it could cause them to no longer exist at all. Uh, big companies are at a, a, a different sort of legal attack envelope where they might seem like a very lucrative target for a payout. So if they do something incorrect, someone might see that as an opportunity to make money off of a company. But either way, you've got lawyers in the mix that are guiding them and telling them, you know, you should do this and not do that. And obviously, companies don't just have one lawyer, usually. They have lots of lawyers, and the lawyers don't always agree with each other. And so there's this, you know, internal confusion around which lawyer are we dealing with, which lawyer is giving us this advice. But lawyers are setting a lot of the policy for companies when it comes to open source. And again, this varies by company. Some companies are entirely controlled by their lawyers. Some companies are entirely ignoring their lawyers when it comes to open source. Companies are also competitive. They're going to compete with other companies for customers, for talent, for resources, and ultimately for money. And this also impacts the decisions that they make when it comes to when and how they participate in open source, when they open source things, these sorts of behavior. So if a company's actions don't make sense, step back and look at it in the lens of who are they competing with? And then perhaps then it starts to make sense. Oh, they did that because they're competing with them. Also think about how does the company feel about its customers? Now you would think that most companies want to, you know, think deeply about their customers, but lots of companies don't. Lots of companies just see the customer as a consumer. 
where you're just somebody who purely consumes our offerings. And if you don't like it, that sucks, but we don't care because we know you're going to buy them anyway. Um, other companies will see customers as partners and try to work proactively with them to really customize their offerings so that the customers are happy with what they're getting. And this isn't like a binary. This isn't, well, companies are in A or companies are in B. This is a spectrum. Um, most companies tend to be somewhere in the middle, um, and they'll move around over time. You'll see that they trend in some directions. Um, sometimes they'll trend in different offerings. Sometimes they will say, well, you know, you have to come get your gasoline from us, and so it's, you know, we don't care whether you like it or not. This is what it is. Um, software companies uh, tend to lean towards this side, unless you're Oracle and we don't talk about them. Um, but uh, another thing to keep in mind is that once a company has more than one employee, it ceases to have a single opinion. Um, large companies are especially multi-minded, where you often have teams that are working independently of each other within the same company. Much, you look at the megacorps, and they have lots of different divisions that aren't even talking to each other, that are constantly reinventing the wheel. And so you end up with a company that is this multi-headed hydra. Um, in open source, it's very easy for people to see a large company and assume that they are a single terrifying dragon, when in reality they're way worse. It's a hydra. There's all these different heads that are going around doing different things. Um, one of the biggest uh, criticisms of companies in open source is you're a company of this many billions of dollars. Can't you just put some money towards that? And in reality, there are 10,000 little startups that are duct taped together in the, the guise of one company, and they don't have that whole pool of money and people to put on any one project. Now, fundamentally, there are three ways that companies interact with open source. And I've sort of given them names. I'm calling them invisible, visible, and homegrown. So invisible open source is open source code that the company knows it's using or maybe they're using and they don't know it, which is also true. Uh, a lifetime ago, when I was a, a solutions architect for Red Hat, it was very common for me to go visit a customer and talk to their IT director, and they would say things like, well, we know all the open source that we use. It's like three things. We just, we just have these three open source things. And then I would go talk to the developers and the ops, and they would say, well, we know all the open source that we use. It's these ten things. And then we would do the audit, just the review of their environment, and we would come back and we would be like, well, we, we think we may have found the 25 things that are open source that are in your environment that you're using. And this happens a lot as a result of dependencies. Why would you reinvent an XML parser? Why would you reinvent an SSL library? You're just going to use these technologies. And a lot of third-party software that's bought and sold as proprietary actually includes these open source libraries underneath it to solve these problems because they have the same thought. Why would we include these extra libraries? We'll just use libxml. We'll just use OpenSSL. Well, it will be good. Um, and you also see this done intentionally in companies where, okay, we're going to build a web app for our, for as a product. It needs a database. Okay, so we deployed one. <laughs> we deployed Postgres. We deployed MariaDB. We deployed a database. It's not something that you could really see externally, but you can look at the web app and go, yeah, there's probably a database behind that. So this is sort of invisible open source. And companies, because it's sort of invisible to them, they assume it's invisible to everyone else, and a lot of times they won't do any sort of investment around these technologies. It's short-sighted, but if you think about it from their perspective, they don't think anyone can see it, so they don't need to do anything about it. They'll just trust that it continues to work. It's sort of that foundational layer where I mean, it's magic, it's just, it's just going to work. Everything is fine. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we move to visible open source. Now this is code that a company uses that is obvious from the outside. Um, sometimes it's obvious due to the nature of how it's used. Uh, a web server. Yeah, we, we know that's Apache. We, we're, we see it. We know that's what that is. Um, sometimes it's something as a service. I see you, so I'm going to call it Grafana. You know, when, when, when Grafana is deployed somewhere, it's really obvious. Oh, look, that's Grafana. It's not pretending to be something else. It's not invisible. Um, if it's a hosted offering, 
if I want to, uh, I will pick on my own employer, if I want to run a database, uh, there are about 16,000 different databases that AWS will happily spin up for you, and they're not pretending to be something else. It's obviously I want to spin up a MongoDB instance. Um, this is code that is very clear. So if you say, hey, what does this company do, and you look at their products, you go, oh, there's the open source, I see it. And companies will behave differently about the open source that is visible in their ecosystem. They're a lot more likely to be active in that open source space. They're a lot more likely to be contributing money, people, time to those spaces, but not always. I mean, sometimes you get companies that say, well, we don't feel the need to do any of these things. We just are gonna make the money. And then homegrown. This is when you've got code that a company wants to release as open source. It could be something that they're open sourcing from the beginning. We had an idea and we started and we opened up a GitHub repo and we started committing in there and off we go. But most of the time when companies are doing this, this is code they were already using internally and they have made the decision to open source it to the world. It could also be company the code that a company has forked from somewhere else, Elastic, and is maintaining now on behalf of everyone else. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of that, especially with big companies, where they will see a piece of code and they will say, we want to dramatically build on top of that, so we're just going to fork it and call it something new. Now, it's worth mentioning there is a fourth way um, some companies have open source projects at the heart of their business and then they build an entirely proprietary stack around it. And the industry calls this open core. Um, you might be able to tell I'm not a fan of this approach from my, uh, my picture here. Um, they really do this to try and take advantage of the goodwill and the community that tends to build around a successful open source project. But when you start to build a business model where you're making all of your valuable features proprietary, you at the same time place limits on the growth of the open source project at the center. Because why would you go and contribute a feature to have the upstream company tell you, no, 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 we were gonna implement that in the proprietary layer. It's, you know, we don't need that in the open source parts. And it makes it really difficult for someone who sees value in that core to want to expand that core. So the most you're ever going to be able to meaningfully contribute to this sort of an open core model is bug fix level changes. And it's very difficult to build a community around just bug fix level changes. People want to feel a sense of ownership and it is difficult to get ownership out of just, I'm doing your laundry, <laughs> I'm mopping your floor. I have no real reason to be here other than to clean up the mess that you don't feel like cleaning up. So now I want to talk about why companies release code as open source. There are lots and lots of reasons. I'm not covering them all. And in fact, I'm not covering the most obvious one, which is that it's the right thing to do and it should be out there as open source code and we're all going to hold hands and sing now. Because that would be great. Companies don't usually think that way. So the first one is abandonware. Uh, when a company is done with code, Sometimes it will choose to relicense it and release it on the internet with no expectation of ever touching it again. It is there as a testament to our mistake. But uh, you can have it if you want. It's, it's, it's right there in that GitHub repo. Um, now, sometimes it is old code that they're sharing in the hopes that it is informational to other people. So this is what we use to solve a problem. We no longer have that problem anymore we thought that it might be valuable for someone else to take it. Uh, sometimes it's sample code. I wrote this code to illustrate a point for a blog post, and I'm not really trying to build a community around it. It's just a one-time code drop, and it lives in GitHub, but don't file issues against it because I'm not coming back. Companies don't really get anything from open sourcing this abandonware. They have, maybe they get a bit of goodwill out of it. Maybe they go, oh, so that's how you were doing that thing wrong for all that time. Um, Sometimes code projects will start off as active and then they will sort of trail off into the state as employees leave the company or the focus of the company shifts away. They say things like, now we're a race car company and we don't do software anymore, but we used to be this. It could be, you know, Slack where they said, hey, we used to be a gaming company and now we're a messaging company. So we're gonna give away all of our gaming components because we don't care about them anymore. There's a lot of reasons for code to either start off or get in this state. 
So one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is they look at software that's been released by a company and they assume it's maintained. I would argue that you sort of need to assume it's not until proven otherwise. You have to really carefully look at that code and say, okay, is it active? Who's contributing to it? When was the last time? Is there a roadmap? Do the documentations refer to things like 2015 as current? You know, you have to sort of look at that and say, okay, in what context is this? The next type of open source is the field of dreams model for open source. There is a famous movie that is probably something that the young people in the room have never seen. But the protagonist hears a whisper which tells him, if you build it, they will come. Well, sometimes companies hear this whisper too, and they start open source projects hoping that other people will come to their tiny repository, which has a Hello World file in it and a roadmap that's three years long, and hoping that people will start writing this code magically for them. Because it would be really nice if we had, you know, this entire suite that would run an entire cloud, but we don't have the time to write that. We're just going to let some open source people do that. And sometimes they have more code in the repo, but they're just really hoping that a sea of free labor will come and make the code amazing. Now, this doesn't happen in practicality. I mean, there's always exceptions. Sometimes miracles occur for no good reason. But companies who don't understand open source very well often think that there's magical open source fairies that will descend upon the code base and fix it all. Um, don't confuse a field of dreams project for a project which is trying to build community at the same time that they are actively contributing to it. That's actually a healthy project. They're just trying to encourage other people to, to join a broader effort. And they just happen to be the only people in that effort right now. So an early stage open source community where there is commits going on, where they're promoting opportunities to contribute. A Field of Dreams project is really where you, you see they're not doing very much work at all. And they're just really hoping somebody else thinks this is a good idea and will take it on. Sometimes you see companies who will go to the great length of documenting and completing an open standard. And then say, well, the reference implementation is left to the discretion of the reader. And that is entirely the same thing. They are hoping that someone will implement this standard in a magnificent way that we can all use. So the third way uh, open source is to compete. Companies will release open source code because they have to in order to compete in the market. Uh, SDKs are a great example of this. Everyone expects an SDK to be open source. Those are the table stakes, so to speak, when it comes to SDKs. If you release a proprietary SDK, everyone sort of goes, why'd you do that? You, you're supposed to do that open source. And so in order to compete, they're forced into open sourcing this SDK. They don't always know what it means to be open source beyond the license, but they are like, okay, we have to open source this. Um, sometimes you'll see companies open source code in response to the open sourcing of code from their competition. If their competition open sources something and they go, oh, no, we do that better. Let's open source that so we can compete. Because it's actually a lot harder to compete with a healthy open source project with a proprietary offering. And companies are starting to realize that more and more now. Uh, Microsoft is a fantastic example of the realization that it is difficult to compete with healthy open source projects with proprietary offerings. Which is weird to say, but in 2022, it's the case. Um, Security is another reason why companies release as open source. Um, customers don't blindly trust software, even from large companies. They want to be able to audit the source code for security issues before they put it into production. This is something that I hear a lot when I talk to customers. They say, we don't deploy proprietary software anymore because we can't trust it from a security perspective. There have been so many security issues that they need the capacity to either audit it in-house or to bring in a third-party auditor to look at that code before they feel comfortable that it is safe to put in. This is especially true for things like IoT deployments. They're very small footprints, but they're in very sensitive places. They don't want to have to risk security being able to have access to every camera in their warehouse because they put an SDK toolkit on there, they want to be able to review everything that's in that. Now, open source does not make code magically secure, <laughs> ask Node.js, um, but it does give the customer a chance to be more in control of their own destiny. So when they have a security issue, they don't, they have themselves to be able to take actions 
they can immediately patch without having to wait for the company to determine that the security vulnerability is serious enough that they're going to think about patching it. Publicity is another reason that companies open source want to convince the world how much you love open source. I know. We're going to open source some things, and then the, everyone is going to love us. Hey, guys, we're part of the community now. We're open source. Wait, what? I hear you. What's that? You, we have to work on this code? We have to keep committing to it? You hippies, look at what we did for you. You don't want this? Fine, we'll take it away. We're done. I'm obviously being a little bit silly here, but companies do behave this way. They do open source for the reasons that they hope that people will like them a little bit better. Um, now, as reasons go to open source, it's a weird one, but it's not necessarily a bad one if they actually do the work. If they actually commit to building the community and getting in there, then okay. You have to earn that publicity. It's not just we have a GitHub repo, so we're open source, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Now, here are some challenges that companies get into when they're interacting with open source. There are millions of these. I just picked a couple. A communication breakdown challenge. Um, employees at companies don't feel comfortable communicating in open source communities. There's a lot of factors for this. Maybe they don't want anybody to know how their company is using this open source software. Maybe it's invisible. Uh, maybe they're concerned that they'll be punished for speaking on behalf of the company. Some company cultures are very locked down and very private, and so for someone to be willing to go on an open source bug report and explain how they're using this open source code is scary to them. They might not even be approved to speak. Sometimes companies will actually map open source contributions in the same process as being approved to speak to analysts in the press. They consider it of the same risk factor. So. That could be a reason why they're not comfortable doing this. They could also be new to open source and just nervous, like lots of people are. That first, that first bug fix, that first pull request is scary. You don't know how they're going to respond to this. I put a lot of time and effort. What if they hate it? What if they don't like it? What if I did it wrong? That goes through a lot of people's minds. It goes through my mind every single time I do a bug request or a pull request, and I've been doing it for my whole adult life. Um, another challenge for companies is arrogance. Some companies have a culture that breeds arrogance, and that spreads into their interactions with open source communities. Don't you know who I am? I work for AWS. You need to listen to me right now. You need to take my patch, and it is right, and I have tested it, and you don't know what you're talking about. I have a much bigger environment than you, and all of this is right. Now, obviously, that arrogance isn't going to get very far in a third-party open source community, but if that's the way that they're talked to, if that's the way their culture works inside, then it will spread out. And sometimes they might want to be a maintainer. They might show up with a massive pull request and say, hey, I wrote all this code. You can make me a maintainer, right? I'll just merge it for you. You don't have to worry about editing and testing it or any of these things. I, I got this. And sometimes they'll even try to buy this position. Sometimes companies will show up and be like, we have a stack of money and this maintainer over here and he's got a pile of code and can we just get all this merged? Obviously, that doesn't really work in open source. But companies will try to do it. Foundations. Some companies say, hey, foundation, can we, can we buy some open source love? We, we just want to give you a large bag of cash. We don't really know what open source is, but we want to just give you some money. Now, foundations, you know, generally you're okay with this. Some of them aren't, some of them aren't, you know, because large bags of money is what keeps foundations going. Um, but it's kind of a cop-out for companies to do this and not do anything else. If your only contribution is to get your logo on the sign and that's all that you're ever going to do, eh, it's not great. I mean, it's not zero. I mean, I'm not trying to say that donating to a foundation is a bad thing because it obviously isn't. You should all donate to foundations. You should all be part of them. They're good things. But it should not be the primary and only way that your company interacts with the open source universe. Then there's the other side of foundations. Hey, you know what's a great idea? We're going to make our own foundation. Now, you want to be skeptical of this when a company says they want to make their own foundation because usually they think it's a puppet and they would like to put their hand up the puppet and go, we're the best open source people in the world, isn't that right? Yeah, well, that's right. It ends poorly. Running a foundation is hard. It's complicated. It has lots of legal restrictions and financial complications that come into play. Most companies are smart enough to get halfway down this road, realize it's a bad idea, and turn around. But sometimes they go all the way down that road, and then they're like, oh, wait, this isn't working. The foundation just sort of rots away. 
Yeah. Red Hat got about halfway down the road about six times while I worked there on making foundations and ultimately decided each time that it wasn't the right idea. Um, this is actually more prevalent in, uh, in hardware than in software for creating foundations. Um, I'm not going to name names because I would like not to be sued. Uh, but uh, but there, if you go and you look for foundations that are started by companies, that exact Google query will give you a lot of useful examples. Um, Culture clash is one big thing here. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about it because we already sort of touched on it a bit. But it's important to remember that teams working on code internally are often siloed from other teams. And they want to have control over their own destiny. And when they contribute to an open source project, they have to give up some of that control. And it makes it a lot uncomfortable for them. They feel like this isn't the way that we do things. Governance is another thing especially when a company is starting an open source project, it's very hard for them to be willing to give up control. I mean, we must be using it. We open sourced it. What if somebody does something really terrible with it? They, they don't understand this code as well as we do. They don't understand the problem that we're really trying to solve. And when you have this model, it makes people reluctant to contribute. When there's no governance structure, when there's no path to ownership, it makes it really hard for people to want to deeply join a community like that. And some companies are perfectly okay with this. They're fine. They say, hey, we're just doing this with a license and we're not trying to build a community around it and it's absolutely fine. And of course, there's an irony here because a lot of these companies that are fine with having a no governance model around their open source are the same ones that want to path towards maintainership in the third party open source projects that they participate in. And that's my time. Uh, there are so many things I could cover on this topic. This was just a very wide buffet tasting of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about how companies deal with open source. I think I have negative one minutes for questions, but if there are one or two, I'll try and take them before they throw me off. Yeah, I think we have uh, time for a little bit of Q&A. So. Um, thanks for the nice overview. Uh, what I'm a bit missing is maybe something that concerns all the companies on this world, which is being a meaningful participant in open source communities and a professional user of open source. Not every company needs to publish everything, not every company needs to build a community, but I think every company uses open source and needs to be professional about that and needs to know how to behave in the open source world. And there are lots of details. For example, is asking a question on Stack Overflow with 20 lines of code a code contribution that needs to be signed off by lawyers or not? So uh, these are standard questions, and if your company hasn't solved them, then that's just something that you haven't done yet. Uh, very good point. Uh, I think that you, know, you do get companies that are in different states in their evolution. Uh, when they start to realize that there is value in being, as you put, a professional open source user uh, and helping their employees to understand how they can meaningfully and safely contribute outwards and what a contribution means. One of the things that my current employer has done is it has defined what is called a simple contribution where if it fits into this box, you can just do it. No paperwork, no approvals are required. We encourage you to go make simple contributions. If it falls outside of that box, please come talk to our experts and we will figure out the quickest way to make that possible for you.